I'm I'm playing a character effectively, but the DNA of that character is who I am. You know, the, there is part of that character that is a put on for the show, but most of that character is me. The, the curiosity that that character has, the love that that character has, the naivety that that character has sometimes, the love of the 80s for sure, you know, is is me. So it's it's that kind of thing that has helped me sort of grow the show and for people to really feel, I think that they understand that there's a vulnerability to what I'm trying to accomplish. And I think that makes people feel that they can come and speak to me because they feel like that no matter who they are, what they are, what they want, that they're going to be accepted and, and cared about. And so at least I hope that's what they think. This is the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast. I'm Jason Blair. That's Jason Usry, the creator, the producer, writer, and head elf of the true crime satire podcast, Santa May Be a Criminal. Jason has been an audio producer for more than half a dozen popular podcasts, including several popular true crime podcasts and those in other genres. Like the Santa Who May Be a Criminal, Jason grew up in a small town in Georgia where he learned the power of writing to help heal and entertain people. It was there in high school in 1997 when the epic James Cameron movie Titanic came out, where he realized that people of all races, genders, and backgrounds could rally around the love story between Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio as the HMS Titanic sank into the sea. That led Jason to write his first screenplay, and probably his second, and many more. Jason was a screenwriter on the 2019 thriller Dead Water, starring Casper Van Dien and Judd Nelson, as well as the 2018 film Running For My Roots. He has also had two films in post-production. But, perhaps, Jason's most creative innovation was to turn the true crime world into a place of laughter kindness, and joy through the Santa May Be a Criminal podcast. Jason says that Santa May Be a Criminal was born out of a love for true crime storytelling and satire, but if I had to venture a guess, it really came out of a love for people, a vocation he and I share in common. Jason also works at a television station in Savannah, Georgia, where during his days, he helps lead a creative team focused on marketing the station. During his nights and weekends, he continues to write screenplays, produces his podcasts, and edits popular podcasts like The Prosecutor's Podcast. For someone in the true crime community, what stands out about Jason and his writing are his empathy. Today, we're going to talk about writing, an art that has the power to heal others, to bring catharsis, to help us see things from a different perspective, and open up new horizons. We're also going to talk about Santa, the elves, and how to really get on the nice list. So Jason, I wanted to uh, thank you for joining us. I'm really super excited about it. I have to tell you that like Santa may be a criminal is definitely one of my uh, most favorite podcasts now. Um, Particularly helpful because I spent, I don't know, about three weeks obsessed with true crime bullshit and the story of Israel (laughs) Keyes. And uh, it was really, really nice to listen to Santa (laughs) (laughs) following that. So, you know, I... uh, I'm, I'm just glad to have you on. I'm honored to be able to have this conversation. You know, you probably don't know this, but, you know, I people have been telling about telling me about you for a long time. You know, Bob Mata, who's the host of the Defense Diaries, was like, have you met Jason? And, you know, Brett has mentioned you before, and some of the uh, prosecutors' fans have mentioned you. 
And it, it's just really cool to have uh, actually to now have had a conversation with you. So, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Secondly, I'm really shocked and honored and grateful that anybody else would say anything good about me uh, or nice about me, I guess. It's uh, no, it's a thrill to, to be talking to you. And, we, you know, we had a, a chat last week just to get to know each other. And, uh, I just, I, I love your energy. I love your show. I love, uh, just hanging out with you. So this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. I feel the same way too. So I, maybe a good way to start, you know, we've talked just a, a little bit about your background and in the intro, but I would love to hear a little bit about like how you ended up ultimately sort of getting into the space where you built this like super popular true crime satire podcast about Santa. Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, my background initially was in, well, first off when I was in uh, high school, I, I started writing my first screenplay when I was in high school. And I think we'll probably get to, to that in a little bit. I'll, I'll skip over it for now, but uh, initially my, college degree, my college major was in business. Uh, and I had, I got a, a scholarship, uh, to a small private university in uh, Southwest Georgia based on a pitch I did to, I wanted to learn to learn the business of film while I was still fostering my creative sort of growth. Mm. Uh, and I got a, I got a scholarship and that scholarship, and again, it was a private university, so that scholarship covered tuition, but it did not, did not cover books or fees. And books and fees at that time for me were a lot because I was you know, putting myself through school. And I was working at Walmart in the produce section to try to do that. Uh, fortunately, in Georgia, we have a program called the Hope Scholarship Program. And we, uh, or I decided at, at the end of my uh, maybe in the middle of my sophomore year to transfer to Valdosta State University, where uh, I joined. Um, I was able to, to get utilize the Hope Scholarship, Hope Grant, and it covered my tuition and my fees, and it paid for a book allowance. And it was there that I was still in the business in business school at that point, but I was working on my second screenplay in my on on a yellow legal pad in the middle of a business management class and the professor called on me to answer a question and you probably don't know this about me a lot of people do but i have a terrible blushing oh. problem <laughs> yeah i hadn't noticed uh, yeah i turned as red as Santa's suit um <laughs> and so uh he called on me to answer this question i could not because I wasn't paying attention and I was so embarrassed. I walked out of that class. I got on a bus to the main campus. I walked into the mass media uh, communications building and there was one person there, a guy by the name of Mike Savoy who entertained me and my request to transfer into the media college, the media school. And that's how I got started. And then in doing that, the mainly the focus of the program was journalism, and I didn't necessarily want to be a journalist. I wanted to do something on the more narrative fiction side. And during that time there, there was a curriculum that was created for me, or not for me. It wasn't for me. Let me not say that. But well, like I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to uh, another professor there, uh, a guy by the name of Frank Barnes, who actually plays Rodney Dale Murphy in Santa Maybe a Criminal. Ah. And, yeah, and he also wrote screenplays and also was interested in doing some of that. So he created a screenwriting curriculum, and then uh, I ended up taking his class on that. And we still trade screenplays to this day. And uh, and so that's kind of how I got started in the sort of the creative realm on that. And then I, I, I wrote and directed and produced a screenplay or a, a, a short film called Chills my senior year of college. And it was the most god awful thing you've ever seen. But I learned so much about the entire creative process 
in you know writing, producing, editing, you know directing, uh, marketing, everything. And I think a lot of that experience has helped me today and what I'm doing with Santa Maybe Criminal because I understand you know the, the process from a holistic sense versus just this very you know, segmented way that many artists operate. So that's sort of a, a, a quick thing for that. And in terms of true crime, I, I've not always been in, you know, interested in true crime. I think, you know, there have been stories that have interested me. I was, I always sort of liked mafia type stories, which is sort of why some of that comes up in the, in the show. And then, you know, I ended up meeting a couple of law enforcement officers here in Savannah, Georgia, that had worked on specialized operations and talked, started to talk to them about their stories and about like the way it really is in law enforcement and policing and, and how the challenges that police officers face. And, you know, certainly there, there's a larger conversation about that, that, that is going on, you know, long-term conversation about that that's going on. But it was really interesting to hear something from the side that I had not seen. And, you know, the other, the big case that really sort of grabbed my attention was the Golden State Killer case. That was something that really, really stuck out to me, the, the way that that case was solved. It, that, that, was, that was a big one for me. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of my... It's kind of interesting. So it's not that really you gravitated toward true crime. You gravitated toward, I guess, what we would call the real stories around the criminal justice system and law enforcement. It just made me think of like how, you know, I ultimately became interested in true crime was sort of like real crime. Mm-hmm. You know, being a, being a reporter and covering things, I never really... You know, when you're young as a reporter, you inevitably are going to find at some point you're going to be covered in the police department. Sure. And, you know, I was I was interested in it, you know, as a natural curiosity. But I, I remember myself finding myself in um, these different scenes or these different moments. Like there was this one time where we did this story where I followed a gun. I followed the gun from its manufacturing point. It was like in Washington state to how it actually ended up in Georgia and then on a rat line to New York and then found all the victims who had been touched by it. Then all the way to the evidence locker, Wow, the ATF seized it. Yeah. It was the life of a gun. And uh, it actually got entered into the congressional record. I found out much, uh, much later. But the thing about that story and working on those kinds of stories, and I'll never forget this woman who had just been shot in the leg. And we, we went out at night in the middle of the night to the scene where she had been shot for the photographer to take pictures. And I just remember thinking, why, like, why do people do things like this? And I think for me, what sort of like, took me into the world of true crime was that idea that like human life is so unbelievably precious. It's so unbelievable precious. And I've always wanted to understand, and it's not just the victim for me. I've also, I I always want to understand how did the victim and how did the criminal sort of like end up on this path? And it's almost like on this narrative that they met and then this thing happens so that's it's very interesting to me because usually when i talk to most people about like how you got into true crime they've got a story right like john benet ramsey or it was it was this or that but but for you it was really the people it sounds like yeah yeah and 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 it's it's um you're right i mean it's as much about you know how did the criminal come to the point where they are you know there, there. Uh, most, most criminals are acting out of desperation in some some sense. I, I don't think that most people are inherently evil. The, there are some, but I think most criminality comes from a place of, you know, lack of resources, lack of education, 
um, lack of proper upbringing, the things that, you know, we all need to become really positive, functional citizens. And it's not that they're bad people, it's they're in bad circumstances. That doesn't mean that the crime is any less severe or important, you know, important, like the, the discipline has to, you know, happen. But it, it is a, it's a more nuanced conversation. It's not as black and white as I think many politicians want to make it. And I think that, you know, education and, you know, support goes a long way. And that support, in my opinion, extends to, you know, both communities and to the people that police those communities. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I come from it from a little different perspective, but, and, but also because I was, I wanted to hear those conversations. I wanted to talk about what's it like. I wanted to ask opinions on things that I'd read in the news because, you know, you read something in the news and, it, you know, or you read something online and it's not always, you know, the, the reality of the situation. Sometimes you have to dig deeper. And I've been fortunate to have people that could explain to me, you know, it's in a very, very clear way, the way things should have happened versus the way things did happen in a lot of these cases. Yeah. Yeah. I completely get that because that, that nuance is key. Cause for me, I think that it's really easy to turn people into monsters yeah. particularly or, or even turn them into fools if we're afraid that like, oh, that person did this and that's why this bad thing happened to them. So it's not going to happen to me. Or even like that guy's a monster. So like none of my friends could possibly do that. And the, I think the reality is like humans are not, we're very different, but we're not as different as like we, we think we are. I think we are. Wait, you know, one of the interesting things about the true crime world, because when I fall into the rabbit hole of mm-hmm. true crime, like it can get really dark really fast. It can get, it can get difficult. You can get a little like paranoid at times, like waiting for the boogeyman to come around the corner. And one of the really nice things about your podcast, I was telling my um one of my partners, I was telling them like it was de-traumatizing for me after listening to all those episodes about his oh, case. But it was just really shocking to me to find a podcast, you know, that people in the true crime space loved that was really just so joyous and inspiring and just interesting. So how did you like, how did you, I don't, I don't think I could have for all the money in the world that even dreamt up the idea of, of Santa <laughs> as a criminal being a podcast. Tell me about it. Tell me how you got there. Well, uh, that's very kind of you to say that. I appreciate that. A lot of people call it a palate cleanser. And it, there is an element of that that I wanted to do. I, I don't claim to be a journalist. I I know that is a very hard job. I know you know that's a very hard job because you lived it. And I didn't want to. Uh, the other thing is I'm notori- I notoriously hate to do research. Oh, but Jason, let me tell you something. That... People in the real world give us really excellent dialogue. Yes. <laughs> like, the real world is crazier than anything my mind could possibly come up. Those of you guys who can write fiction have always impressed me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, well, the, the, the truth of the matter is, like many podcasts, uh, this show was born partly out of the pandemic. Uh, it was a it was an idea I had been kind of tossing around in my mind for a while. I wanted to initially write it as a television uh, series. And when the pandemic happened and the world stopped, I had one, um, I had one show. The show was initially born during the pandemic and that I, I wanted to write as a television series. It's something I've been kind of kicking around for a while. and we, uh, me and a few of a few friends of mine that are podcasters that actually also edit their shows. I, we were on a text thread and I always remember this and it's, and it's relevant because of the, the Santa Claus and the, the North pole and the snow. It was the night of the vice presidential debate. 
between Kamala Harris and Bob <laughs> Pence. And I, I have a feeling I know where you're going. <laughs> yes. And there was a fly that looked like a lo- little lump of coal that landed on Mike Pence's snow white hair during <laughs> that, <laughs> during that, that, in, that uh, debate. And that, that was, I don't remember what the prompt was in our text thread, but that night, we started talking about this podcast and I, I said that this makes me want to do my Santa Claus is a criminal podcast. And, and so uh, the, I was asked like, well, what do you mean? And I kind of threw a few things out there and they were like, well, you, you have to do this now. You have got to do it. And I said, yeah, but I had to find actors and they're like, well, we're act- like, we could, we'll do voices for it. And I was like, okay. So the show started out very, very, with a very small universe and, Fortunately, as I started to produce episodes, you know, and I kind of was going at first hat in hand to people asking them to, you know, come on the show, you know, begging them to come do a voice for me. Like now, fortunately, people ask me to do voices for the show. And so it, it sort of started sort of as a kind of a not as a joke, but sort of as a, a veiled threat that I'm going to do this show. And then me kind of baiting people to see if they'd be interested. And unfortunately people were, and it's just been the, the most fun. I'm almost at a thousand pages of writing Mm -hmm. for the, these first two seasons. I'll, I'll probably land closer to 2000 words by the time the series concludes. And it's a great time. And it's in, and as, and I'm glad that, the heart of it comes through because it it is designed to have a very sweet center, a very hopeful center. And for the, the main character, Richie Buck to respond in a way to the things that he's presented with, with sort of a, uh, those, those season two, he takes a little harder stance he takes it in the the nicest Southern harder stance that he can because he all he still believes deep down in the magic of Christmas and Santa Claus. So yeah. Yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Oh, I believe you. Like one of the really cool things about it, like I, I remember being, um, you'll love this story. The way that I originally got into journalism, yeah. totally by accident. I was always like an avid reader of books when I was a kid, read Stephen King. I, I love the V books. If anybody's ever seen the V movie, I have, I still have in a box across from me every paperback that was, uh, that was done there. But I didn't really see myself as a writer, but I wrote when I, when I moved from Georgia to Virginia um, at my high school, my journalism teacher, Ann Sharp, I will never forget her. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote letters to the editor and apparently I wrote some letters to the editor that were critical of uh, their journalism and how they're running the newspaper. And one day I'm in the cafeteria downstairs at Centerville high school. And I, someone said my name, they were like Jason Blair. And I see this redheaded woman who's a teacher spin around and say, Oh, you're Jason Blair. (laughs) And it was Ann. And um, Miss Sharp just gave me the uh, the the challenge, like you know, if you have so much to say, why don't you come join us? And that's what ultimately got me into journalism. But during one year of school, it may have been my like sophomore, or it must have been my junior year. You know, we're in a wealthy Northern Virginia suburb, um, typical Washington D.C. suburb. You know, but we're on the outskirts of like a rural area. And during the winter break one year, one of our students, one of our classmates, a guy who was one of the few people who was nice to me when I first came to the school in ninth grade, he had been taken out in this rural area along with his cousin, and he had been shot in the back of the head. That's not the kind of thing that ever happens. Oh, my God. And I got assigned, or I chose to, I can't remember cover the story and there's a reporter from the Washington Post who was also covering it. And we, we talked a lot because I became sort of like a source for who she could talk to, to write the story. And one of the things that I saw in that story was like 
journalism and writing gave the family members, the friends, his girlfriend, the opportunity to, you know, sing their love song to him, to be in their process of healing, to help people understand and get their heads around them. And they, and people would ask me later, why did you get in journalism? I would always say, well, I saw it had the power to heal people. I saw it had the power to help people. And as corny as it sounds, the power to entertain people. And I guess that kind of just sums up why I love your podcast, because it does have a healing force. It does have a helping force because it makes you think about things in a different way. And it entertains. And in most stories, like most stories do one of those things. But it's really neat to have something that brings all three of those things that I've been thinking about since I was a 17-year-old boy, it to, it brings all of them together. So that's a part of its power for me. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And and not unlike you, I think we we were cut from the same cloth. The the one of the reasons that I wanted to write screenplays, I sort of alluded to it earlier, and it's a little ironic being today we're recording this. The one of the things, I, so I'm a I'm from the South. I'm a natural storyteller. You know, my favorite thing when I was growing up was to sit with my granddaddy out on his swing and him tell stories and you know just be together. And unfortunately, we can do that now with podcasting. We just get to have, you know, we can have an audience across the world. But the the reason that I first initially got interested in writing screenplays is very similar to what you just said, and that you can connect humanity through the written word and through art. And so I was... Uh, this is going to be, this is a little cheesy. And it, like I said, it's a little bittersweet because of today with the um, news of the uh, Titan submersible that just happened. But when I was set, when I was also 17, my high school girlfriend wanted to go see the movie Titanic. And so we went and, you know, it's a spectacle. It's all the things it's, it's a fine movie, but what really, really, connected with me was I was in a small South Georgia town. And during that movie, people of every age, race, creed, you know, coupling, whatever, they all responded and reacted to the art and the content in the same way at the same time. And I remember thinking very clearly during that movie this is how you can change people. This is how you can affect people. This is how you can really make a difference. And it does sound cheesy and it does sound naive in a way and, you know, hopelessly optimistic, but that's inherently who I am. And so I, that was in December of 2017, 18, something like that. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? So I grew up in most of my life. I grew up in. I was born in Dothan, Alabama. So I'm a I'm an Alabama football fan. But I grew up most of my life in a town called Cairo, Georgia, which is spelled like Cairo. And my high school mascot was the Syrup Makers. So if you can imagine the like uh, the Kool Aid guy, you remember the the Kool Aid yeah picture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. picture. So, yeah, yeah. So if you can imagine that with a big C on its chest for Cairo, that was pretty much our mascot. <laughs> we were terrifying the other teams. But that's where I grew up for, for most of my life. And that's where I graduated high school, went through my entire from I moved there in third grade. My parents got divorced when I was in the eighth grade or so. And so we stayed there through the end of my high school career. My, my family actually still lives just outside of Cairo. And again, I now went to Thomas University in Thomasville, Georgia, which was our neighboring town. And then to Valdosta State, which was, was an hour and 10 minutes away from Cairo. So most of my family remains in Southwest Georgia. 
So eighties, nineties. Yeah. So I was I was born in nineteen eighty, the in November of nineteen eighty, and so we it went before uh, we moved to Cairo in eighty. I think we moved there in 89, I think is one 89, 88 or 89. So before that we lived in, I was born in Dothan, Alabama. We lived in um, Albany, Georgia, America's Georgia, Cuthbert, Georgia, back in Dothan, wow. Troy, Alabama, Luverne, Alabama. Luverne, Alabama is where I was. My dad came into me and he said, you have a very important decision. This was in second grade. I remember this specifically. We were, I was in second grade and he said, you have a very important decision to make today. And I said, what is it? And he said, are you going to be an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan? <laughs> and I did not like the sound of the word Auburn. Uh, and also Alabama was the state we were in. So I was like, I, that's, I'm going to be an Alabama fan. So, and my dad didn't have any skin in the game. He was a Georgia Tech fan. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah. So, yeah, so I became an Alabama fan that day and have been ever since. But uh, about a year after that, year and a half after that, we moved to Cairo. And that's where we, we stayed the rest of the time. And um, what in the world were your parents? <laughs> yeah. What did they do to move that much? So my dad was a he doesn't do this anymore, but he was a uh, he was like a grocery store fixer. Like he was really good at merchandising and ah. you know, fixing sort of you know, making things sell, I guess. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like moving things little... on the shelves and where they're supposed to go and the height and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So his company would send him around to different stores in the region and he would go there for a year and get sales back up and then they'd send him to the next one. And so we went all around like that and um, until we got to Cairo and then he had a store in Cairo and then he had a store in a neighboring town for a couple of years and a store in a neighboring town for a couple of years. And then he and my mom's marriage fell apart and they, um, and he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to be far away from us. And so he ended up staying, you know, there and like this company let him do that. And now he builds boats and is about to retire. But, but yeah, no, it's, it, it was an interesting it, that, from that, from that standpoint, it was an interesting childhood. I, you know, I, I did all the normal things that, you know, kids in the South do. I played sports. I, I was a pretty good student. You know, I, I think I graduated like seventh or eighth in my class. Pretty studious. Uh, very, you know, I wasn't in any sort of clique or anything. Like I was just sort of like the guy that just kind of roamed around and was friends with everybody as much as I could be. And, but I think a, a lot of that was me again assessing and understanding people and and accept and accepting people like for what they were and and trying to help people because you know i i do think and hope that i i think i'm pretty empathetic and i hope i come across as very empathetic and sympathetic uh to people and you know hopefully that comes through in the podcast i think it does and 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 it does. And, you know, it did start as a, as a very small sort of, you know, exercise in this very, very focused sort of true crime satire thing. And it, and it, it that remains its sort of core identity. The fortunate thing, I think, has been that over the course of the life of the show so far, it has grown into a lot more about the characters than it has about the case. And I think that's kind of fun and, and important because people change over the course of time. And there are, there are situations that happen in the podcast that spur Richie Buck to change and introduce other scenarios, real life scenarios into his life that I think people can relate to and, and enjoy. Could you, share a little bit about the characters and what their inspiration was and what they're sort of, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of a writer. Almost every character has a sort of message or purpose. Yeah. So, you know, Richie Bach was, it's funny. I'm going to tell you something, a story that's pretty, pretty interesting to me. So Richie Bach was really me just finding a fun sounding name that just rolled off the tongue and it sounded like it was from the South. Right. 
And it just, and it just sort of like, and it, I didn't go through very many names. Richie's the one trying to solve whether. Sam yes. Yes. Yeah, so Richie is the, it's the main character of the show. And I play Richie Buck. And that's, that was by design because again, in the, in the very beginning, I was like, nobody's going to want to do this. So I'll take on the lion's share of the work. I'm going to do this as sort of a proof of concept. You just thought it was going to be you talking to yourself in different voices. Some of it. Yeah. You know, I, I also play E.B. Cooper, the Easter bunny as well. So, and I changed my voice a little bit for that, but it was by design because this was, a, this is a shoestring operation over here, you know, uh, or maybe I should say Christmas light string operation, but the, so Richie was definitely a, you know, just a sort of a Southern archetype, you know, by and large, we were overly nice. We like to tell stories. Uh, we like to find analogies and things like that. We like to drink. And that was a big part of what he was. And what's funny is like, I, I'm not, I, I love about the South that even the insults are polite. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and we're overly descriptive sometimes. Like there's a, there's an, there's a scene in the first episode where he talks about like the red Coleman cooler that's sitting on the porch and, you know, there's stuff like that. That's, you know, tries to be very descriptive about things that are that in, in all of these things are things that matter to me or someone on the show. Like it's, again, it goes back to having intention with the show. And I can talk a little bit about that in a minute and a couple of things that, well, I'll talk about with detective strong in particular, but so Richie Buck is the main character. He is trying to solve this case. Effectively the show is Santa Claus ends up going to a, a guy named Rodney Dale Murphy, who I referenced earlier. Rodney Dale Murphy was out of milk on Christmas Eve. So he left out some what's known as hunch punch here in the South, which is basically grain alcohol with, with fruit and stuff like that. He leaves that out. And, um, and yeah, so uh, Rodney Dale Murphy leaves, a, leaves some hunch punch out for Santa Claus instead of milk. Santa drinks that Santa has to uh, stop and make a pit stop on the side of the road because he's inebriated he is arrested, but he, at the scene of his arrest, there is a body found in front of his sleigh who, that appears to have been struck by his sleigh. So now Santa is going to jail for both, uh, you know, a DUI, but also vehicular manslaughter. Uh -oh. Yes. And so um, he's arrested by Sheriff Bradley Dewberry, who's played by Kevin Grogan, who is one of the police officers I, I mentioned before, who sort of let me in on kind of the behind the scenes of what happens, like really happens in policing. He was a former uh, patrol officer and homicide detective here in Savannah, Georgia. Detective Samantha Strong is played by uh, Dr. Shiloh from L.A. Not So Confidential. I also edit their show, uh, their podcast. She is a very, very strong woman. I wanted to have a very strong woman at the core of this show. And she was on that initial text thread and is, has been from the, from the beginning, one of the four or five biggest supporters of the, the podcast of, of kind of forcing, like not forcing me, but, you know, pushing me to continue to do it and make it, you know, really sing. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things about that, I, I wouldn't be here if people hadn't been yelling in my ear for like three years to sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, right. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, so one of the things talking about the intention of the show and giving basically giving gifts back to people. So Shiloh's daughter, Sydney, plays Ellie the Elf, which Ellie arrives in our Chris, our North Pole episodes. And for the first season, the, the the thing that I found when people started asking me to be on the show, everybody wanted to be an elf. And I told Shiloh in the beginning that in in the episodes that Sydney was going to play in season one, I was not going to change her voice because I wanted her to have Sydney's voice at that age always. That was mm -hmm. my gift to her. Yeah. The second season, Sydney's voice gets changed, and the the there is a reason built into the podcast as to why that happens. Um, and it's in, it was completely in the universe. 
but uh, Doctor Strong or Detective Strong is the is is a main character. Uh, then we have uh, Doctor Peter Whimsical, who is a forensic psychologist. He has a counter psychologist who is Doctor Myra Abernathy. Doctor Myra Abernathy ends up becoming Richie's love interest in season two, and pushes a lot of the narrative forward in season two. We have a cult expert, Dr. Prince Jesper. That is also someone who was on that that initial text thread, who is Rebecca Sebastian from the show Criminality. So Melissa and Rebecca do that show. So, uh, and then of course we have, you know, Brett and Alice who play the prosecutors who are prosecuting Santa Claus, Bob Mata, who is playing uh, a character named Derek Rudolph, who is Santa Claus's defense attorney. Funny story about that. <laughs> I, that character is based that on line, that line <laughs> where he says the, uh, he talks about the little red mitt. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> if, if the mitt ain't a fitting, you best be acquitting. Right. And, and I could actually imagine Bob saying that mm-hmm. his closing. <laughs> I was so, I was so proud of when I wrote that line, I was so proud of it because part of true crime is about recognizing tropes in true crime. Mm-hmm. And that line, you know, that Johnny Cro- Cochran line from the OJ trial, you know, if the glove don't fit, if the glove don't fit, you best to quit or whatever it is, or you yeah. gotta quit, whatever it is, is such a thing in true crime lore. And I had to, I wanted to have something like that in my show to just show there are these things that people seize on. And I was sitting here one night late, working on the script and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's great. And Derek Rudolph is actually sort of modeled off of David Rudolph from the staircase. And there's also, there's an owl theory that works its way through the staircase. The Michael Michael Peterson. Yes. He was accused of uh, potentially, was it, was that the one where he was accused of murdering his partner with a hot poker? And yes. On the poker and people began believing that possibly some owls in the neighborhood may have done it. Yeah. So that, that one was, yeah. So he, the story, the quick story of that was that it was, I think it was in December. It was sort of, it was late. They had a pool. They were out by the pool. He was smoking a cigar. You know, his story is his wife went inside and he go, he falls asleep outside. He goes back inside and he founds her bloody at the bottom of the staircase, still alive. He calls 911. They get there, but she dies. A bit like Santa's story. Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It could, it could, it could go either way, you know? Right. Um, so the, uh, the state's theory was that he was, he was having a liaison outside of his marriage that she had found it, confronted him and that he attacked her with a, the, whatever the blow poker thing for the fireplace and beat her to death. And you know, that's how she died. The, the interesting thing about that is he, he got out on an Alfred plea because the main state witness or or, uh, expert for blood spatter was found to have not have the credentials and to have misrepresented evidence in trial much long, much after his trial was over. And an Alfred plea, that, that's where you plead guilty, but you still sort of like protest your innocence. Basically, yeah. It's it's effectively, and you'd have to have, real, you'd really need a lawyer to explain it, but effectively it's like, you have enough evidence to convict me, but, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's like that I'm innocent or what, but basically you're admitting that they have enough evidence to convince you, convict mm-hmm. you, but it's a, basically a deal with the state that they're, you know, at his time he was of advanced age. He'd, you know, served. I can't remember how long he'd served in prison, but, but it was one of those things where you could go back to trial and re- try to retry this, you know, with this bogus evidence or, you know, give him time served and let him out. You know, right. and, and in that one, I recall at some point they found the actual blow poke with no blood on it in the basement. The cops they did. Like- they found it. They found it very shortly before the trial was over and it had cobwebs on it and it was clearly had not been used for that purpose. That's not to say he couldn't have used a different one and got rid of it, but the, the blow poke that everybody that they had built their case around 
they had a picture of it, you know, from some Christmas photo from a previous year. And it was, you know, they, they find this thing in the, in the basement or somewhere. And they're like, well, there's nothing on, there's no forensics on this. The, and then the owl, owl theory came in and it was that in the autopsy, there were some micro feathers found from a, from an owl in her hair and the, the markings in her skull could have, could have been, you know, talon marks from an owl. And apparently in that area of North Carolina where this happened, there had been a couple of attacks or something like that. And I might be getting that wrong, but the, the, the thought was that potentially when she was walking back in, she was attacked by an owl. She tried to get in her, you know, the owl had and then crashed that- into her skull. She started to bleed. She went to go upstairs, got woozy, fell down. And then when she fell down, she fell down, hit her head, got, tried to get up again, slipped in her own blood, hit her head again. And that was what caused the massive blood loss. So that's the truncated version of the owl theory. But as, uh, but again, like these sorts of things, these these very popular cases are things that I try to find ways to put into the show as a nod to the consumer base that I'm talking to. And so Bob, Bob Mata, who plays uh, Rudolph, it was inspired based on which character from... So the the character the defense attorney for Michael Peterson was named David Rudolph. Okay, so this this cracks me up. So the um, on Facebook, the prosecutors podcast, you know, which you edit, it's got this um, book club that its fans have put together. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but like on the cover of it, you know, it's got its rules, and like one of the rules is like don't knock our podcast. And it's got some line. I'm going to butcher what it is because I don't have it in front of me right now. But it, it's like, you know, we're all here because we love the podcast. So, like, don't drag on it. Same goes for Brett and Alice, right? So, like, don't criticize Brett and Alice. And then it says something like, and owls. <laughs> don't shame owls. And then it says in parentheses something like, or Bob. Don't hate on Bob either. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, the, the you know there there's a lot there are a lot of like memes posted in that group about owls and anytime owls are referenced, I just go into the comment box and just type who. <laughs> every every time I see it, I do it just to just to do. If owls to, laughs every time. Too. <laughs> yes. So, um, but yeah, but those those are sort of the main the main. Of course, Santa Claus is the main character. That's a guy that I worked with in television for a lot of years his wife his real wife in real life is a is was a radio dj for a long time she is and she's also a voiceover actress she plays santa claus's wife but we have characters we have a bunch of elves we've got a we've got a godfather inspired elf named the todd father his name his real name is todd o'tannenbaum but he's known as the todd father because he's sort of like leads the underworld at the north pole you know we've got Uh, I actually, to to kind of, you know, sell how serious I was about making this as fun and, you know, I don't know, crazy as possible. So I reached out to Chesley Sully Sullenberger, the Miracle on the Hudson captain, Mm -hmm. to ask him a to give a comment on bird strikes because there is a a lead that's given during the show. Land says, the plane in the um, Hudson River outside yeah, of New York. Is yes, that- yes. After a bird strike, after I think they hit, it was a geese strike or something, he landed that there. And and I reached out because one of the counter theories to the narrative that the the basically in the show well, I don't want to give it all away, but the there's a counter narrative that Santa hit some birds and what kind of birds? Well, owls, of course. <laughs> so, um, so you actually reached time. out to Sullivan to ask about the bird strike? I, I certainly did. Well, see, that's the interesting <laughs> thing. I was thinking about you moving around everywhere. And as you were saying it, I was like, oh man, this poor kid. But like one of the real blessings uh, of moving around a lot as a kid is it's really easy to like, get to know people and have the courage to go introduce yourself to some random person, but go ahead, keep on going. 
Well, yeah, I, and, it, you know, I've just, and actually I was a very, very shy kid and, and still can be very shy, but the, the, I, I have learned to be bold when it comes to, you know, having, having a mission on something. And so like right before I started this podcast, I sat for, I, I had the scripts done and I, I really, really toiled and worried over actually recording anything because, what? well, because I didn't like the sound of my own voice. Mm. And, and I hear this is a common theme for people who get in front of the mic yeah. for the first time that they, because you don't hear your voice the way other people hear your voice, you know, and it's sort of jarring for you to hear it the way other people hear it. And I didn't like the way my voice sounded. Now I've grown to like my voice now because I think that I recognize that I have, I, there is the authenticity. I do try to bring the authenticity in it. And I just basically have to listen to it so much that I have to force myself to like it. But the, the thing that I had to tell my, there, there are a few pieces of advice I had to make myself take. The first one was get over yourself, like, mm. you know, create the content, just create it and then see and put it out there. And that's always the scary thing. And as, as you know, the other thing, one of the other things that prepared me for this was writing screenplays. There is a ton of rejection in that. Like there's almost no acceptance or success in it. Right. I've been fortunate enough to find some success, but all my stuff has been through, again, creating relationships and people that I can work with that when we collaborate, I know that they're going to trust some of what I do and, and the screenplay, the movies that you see that I've written, you know, who knows how close they are to the script. Some of them are vastly different, but, you know, creating these relationships and fostering an environment of collaboration and fostering an environment of acceptance has served me well, but I also had to give myself that grace. And mm -hmm. that was hard to do because I, I'm my own worst critic, you know? So, so I had to get over myself. Uh, the other thing that I had to do, and this was something that happened last year that people got a real laugh out of is that I had to commit to the bit and committing to the bit meant that when I travel to crime con or to true crime podcast fest, I can't remember if I did the true crime podcast festival or not, but either way, I, I have this get up. I have my podcast shirt on. I have an ugly sweater fedora and I wear a, uh, a red suit with uh, with looks like Santa Claus cuffs on it and red <laughs> shoes. And I went through the airport like that. I, I flew on the plane like that. I went to every get together like that. I lived that. And you know what it did was it sparked conversations with people that I never would have met before. And mm -hmm. it was really, really it's almost uh, liberating to do that because I'm, I'm playing a character effectively, but the DNA of that character is who I am. You know, you know, the, there is part of that character that is a put on for the show, but most of that character is me. It's it, the curiosity that that character has, the love that that character has, the, naivety that that character has sometimes the love of the eighties for sure, you know, is, is me. So it's, it's that kind of thing that has helped me sort of grow, you know, the, the show and the, for people to really feel, um, I think that they understand that there's a vulnerability to what I'm trying to accomplish. And I think that makes people feel, that they can come and speak to me because they feel like that no matter who they are, what they are, what they want, that they're going to be accepted and, and cared about. And so at least I hope that's what they think. Jason, if it's not for the money, it sounds like and it's, no, not, it's not, it's definitely not for the money. <laughs> it's not to hear your own voice. Why do you do it? Because it, it, it gives me purpose. I've always, I, I, I said this to uh, a guy that I met 20 something years ago. I mean, this has been, I've been writing again since I was 17 years old. I started writing. In fact, I, I think I shared this with you the other day. The first screenplay I wrote, I wrote on a 200 and something dollar 
word processor that like you, you used to buy them and you would see like one line of text when you would type <laughs> and Huff you know, write a screenplay. Yeah, very, and, and that screenplay, the first one, cause I didn't have any, I didn't know what I was doing. I wrote, it was like 175 pages. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so uh, it was called to die in your arms. It was a civil war love story about a, Union soldier who fell in love with a girl from the South sort of thing. It was just, it was, gar- it was garbage. But anyhow, uh, again, very, very hope, a very hopeful thing, right? One man's garbage, one man's gold. Yeah, right, right. But um, never trust writers on whether their writing is good for the writer. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> they always are their worst critics. That much I will give them. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But yeah, no, I met a producer, a former producer of, of, of movies and he actually had produced the mickey mouse club for a while and things like that and he cornered me one day i was helping with a workshop i was i was pretty young i was just out of college but i was helping teach some high school kids how to do video and he cornered me one day and he said so so why do you do it why do you write and i said well because i just don't know how not to anymore I stay up at night if I don't. And you know, I stay up at night and I know you do. (laughs) And that has, that has continued. I've told people before, like if I could stop doing it, I probably would, but I'm miserable if I'm not writing or creating or thinking about a story or, you know, finding dialogue or listening to people and understanding how conversations interact or seeing you know, resonance in human interaction that I think can work in the context of the universe of Santa, maybe a criminal. And it really just in my core being it, it gives me very much purpose. Sounds like a, A sense of meaning and allows you to help sort of like create meaning for yourself the actual act, but the actual act of writing itself and creating, not just the writing, because the creating is a part of it. It seems like that gives you purpose and gives you meaning, but it also allows you to make meaning out of the world around you. It does. And it also, as the show has grown, it has given me, a lot of motivation because a lot of people are really connecting with the story and with, you know, things that happen in the story that they're able to relate to. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten, you know, a lot of them are DMS on Twitter or Facebook where someone writes to me about how a moment made them cry you know, in a good way, or it, it made them uh, hopeful, or you know, it has given them some some sense of belonging. Those things, if only that happened, I would do it, even if it didn't really in, in excite me anymore. But and I don't think that's going to ever happen. But the fact that other people now are listening to this initially, I was just doing it for me is sort of a laugh. And trying to figure out and also trying to just kind of work on my muscles of writing and creating and trying to learn how to like build soundscapes and audio and and tell stories through a medium where you can't see it and create something that in your mind, you know, you could envision sort of what is happening. That was sort of the initial play for me. And now it's become and and the, the show has evolved. I think to be more inclusive of what the audience wants. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you a story that you might find interesting about the, the podcast. Um, I was listening to the episode where Richie, you know, the main character goes to the North North pole, or as we call it on your show, the Mm NOPO. And, you know, there's that, you know, the elf kind of love, uh, love line, and I'll let you say it because I'm going to butcher it. But I had, you know, it was a couple weeks ago, and my best friend, she had 
just done me a solid and went over the top to be supportive of, of me. And, you know, I wanted to get her something nice. So I went on looking for things and couldn't find anything. And this is funny because it all connects to the, to the podcast world because I stole this idea from watching a video on someone's podcast. And so I looked up this line that I saw on a coffee mug and I bought her the mug and it said something like, I might not get it right, but like our friendship isn't, and it may have even been Alice's mug, but our friendship isn't a big thing, but it's a million little things. Mm -hmm. And then I heard that, line about the love and the elf and go ahead and say the line. And it just kind of brought tears to my eyes because I thought of in that moment, how like unique and how rare it's, it is to find love that powerful. And yeah. I didn't really think on a true crime podcast about Santa tears would be welling up in my eyes. Yeah. That that's one that that's actually that might be the, my favorite line of dialogue I've ever written um, because of that. And I have had a bunch of people that have written me about that. So effectively the, you know, Richie goes to the North pole, the NOPO to try to find out where Santa Claus is. Santa Claus is out of jail at the moment. He's escaped and he is up to this point. He's still missing. And, he goes to the North Pole. He finds out that Santa Claus has a daughter named Savannah Claus and her husband, Ralphie, because every Christmas story needs a Ralphie. Of course. Uh, and Ralphie is a human. So Savannah met Ralphie when they were touring a West Virginia coal refinery because coal plays a yeah, in, big role in Santa's job, man. Right. And so, um, so Ralphie and Savannah fall in love and, Richie interviews Ralphie and Savannah about where Santa Claus is and doesn't get very far with that. But at the end of the interview, and again, this is in the midst of Richie trying to figure out his own love life and some, some of his own internal conflict. Because Richie's just so genuine. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Richie stops. So they go to leave the room and Richie talks to, Ralphie stops Ralphie. Savannah has already walked out. Now, Savannah is an elf. Santa Claus is an elf. Savannah is an elf. You know, Mrs. Claus and Karen Claus is an elf. And, you know, so elves live hundreds of years and humans have a very finite period of time that they, they live. And Richie asks Ralphie, he says, so, so tell me how you, how you do it. You know, how do you, how do you love her knowing that, you know, she's going to outlive you by hundreds of years. And Ralphie says, I love her years worth in a day to make up for it. Hmm. And it, it feels like, you know, I wish there was more of that. It it's sometimes people need to be loved years worth. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is sometimes missing because everybody wants for them. And it, the, this, the selfless, that selfless response, I remember when I wrote it, I was like, oh, my God, like this is this is such a special piece of dialogue. And actually, the couple that did that, had they have a podcast, Wicked Deeds, and I, I met them at True Crime Podcast Festival last year, I think it was. And I, you know, it was special. I wanted them to have a part together. And so I kind of created that storyline basically for them. And. I, it, it was a very, very special thing for them to do that. And, you know, that's my favorite line. I love the, if the mitten ain't a fitting, you best be a quitting. I love the scene too, you know, going back to sort of the, the feelings of hope and, and things, you know, the Richie's parents are past in the, in the timeline of the show. And um, he has a, a psychic come in who he talks to about and he's trying to get where Santa Claus is because, you know, sometimes psychics come in to help cases. Right. And that's yeah, one yeah. of the tropes. Right. And so um, at the end of the, the sort of conversation, she tells him, her name is Jasmine. The show is Paige Elmore from true crime reverie. 
uh, she says, basically she gets his parents that come through to him and basically tell him that they're proud of him and that they love him. And is that, that was another moment a lot, I got a lot of feedback on, you know, an interesting thing about that, like that moment, you know, when I, when I read the, that line and, and, and thought about that, like the loving so deeply and so much more, I, there's one day I, I walked into my office at work and I, I pulled out an old newspaper clipping and I read it to a bunch of my staffers, stunned in silence by it. And, and you're going to find like the, probably the parallel here, you know, at first this sounds super depressing. It came from the New York times on September 12th, 2001. And I almost have it memorized, but I also have it in front of me, but the, so September 12, 2001, you know, I was in New York on 9-11, and it started, it was written by Sonny Kleinfeld, one of my colleagues at the Times, and it started by just saying, it kept getting worse. And then it said, the horror arrived in episodic bursts of chilling disbelief, signified by trembling floors, sharp eruptions, cracked windows. There was an actual, unfathomable realization of gaping, flaming hole in the first one of the tall towers, and then the same thing all over again in its twin, right? And then there's, there was merciless sight of bodies helplessly tumbling out, some of them in flames. Finally, the mighty towers themselves were reduced to nothing. Dense plumes of smoke raced through the downtown avenues, coursing between the buildings, shaped like tornadoes on their sides. Every sound was cause for alarm. A plane overhead. Was another one coming? No. It was a fighter jet. But was it a friend or an enemy? People scrambled for their lives, but they didn't know where to go. Should they go north, south, east, west? Stay outside? Go indoors? People hid beneath cars and each other. Some comp- contemplated jumping into the river. For those trying to flee the very epicenter of the collapsing World Trade Center towers, the most horrid thought of all finally dawned on them. Nowhere was safe. And had goosebumps in the room that led to him. And and they said, like, why do you find that so powerful? Is it hard to go back to that? Isn't it hard to go back to that place? I said, no, I find it so powerful. Just like that line about loving an elf. Because in that moment when I read that, I felt heard. I felt just like when I read that elf line, that someone understood the level of love I feel for this person right now and for the role they in my life. And when I read Sonny's story, I felt that someone understood. Someone heard what I felt that day. And that's just one of the, and I know that was a long excerpt, but it's just one of the most powerful things to me about writing. Right. Well, you know, and the other thing too, that's funny about it is that when, um, yeah, I wrote that, I wrote that line that, that those characters, they might come back. I don't know. I didn't, they were, they were not designed to be recurring. And like I said, I met Brittany and John at true crime podcast festival last year. And it was funny. They, you know, we did this, they were so sweet. They came over, we talked and then, we were doing like a live like Spotify live thing. And it was me and detective strong or Richie Buck and detective strong, me and Shiloh. And we did it and I screwed it up and didn't record. I couldn't figure out how to record it. So we had to recreate it later. People have no idea how many times that happens in podcasts. Oh my gosh. It's so, it's so much. Um, But they were very sweet. They actually, we, they had met them 30 minutes before in person and they came over and they sat there and, during the live and I, I just love them ever since I've got a great podcast, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a testament to like, you know, the people that you meet in your life, they are on their own continuum, right? They're on their own timeline and, and what they have. And you can take from every person you meet, you, you know, some sort of piece of wisdom or, mm-hmm. or, or goodness or badness, you know, not niceness or naughtiness. Right. But everybody is in their own sort of universe. And then as you kind of migrate past them, things that 
can impact you. And, and the thing that impacts, of course, impacts Richie and, and thankfully has impacted you and other listeners who reached out was that powerful testament of love in spite of what he knows is, is his runway is much is short. You know, he's going to lose her much more quickly. Her life will continue on, but, but it is a thing that I think people recognize and deal with, you know, Right, because you could look at it the other way, right? Like, right, horrible. This is terrible. This is, you know, my spouse is going to live hundreds of years beyond me. Or you can look at it like... From her perspective, for sure. Yeah, and that this is... Or you could take it the other way. This gives me an opportunity to love someone so much more and so much more powerful. Absolutely. No, no, I'm, I'm really glad that that's connected with people. That, that was, again, that's my favorite. Like I said, it's probably the, the best line of dialogue I've ever written. And it's certainly the most, the, that line of dialogue that I've gotten the most feedback on for sure. So it's, and that's the thing, like you discover these things. Like I didn't, I didn't, that wasn't a plot out thing. Like I, I knew I was going to write that scene that day that it was going to be, you know, the two of them and Richie interrogating, not interrogating, interviewing them. And just in writing the dialogue, you know, sometimes you just let the character speak to you and you try to just look at where they are in their, your, your perception of their lives. And then of course I'm drawing on every variable that I've ever encountered with people to, to try to figure out what's interesting. And, and that one thankfully ended up pretty interesting. Thanks for joining us for the first of two episodes with Jason Usry, the host of the Santa Maybe of Criminal podcast. Next week, we're going to continue our conversation on the thought process that goes into writing fiction, the inspirations for some of his characters on the podcast, what working in podcasting in Hollywood are really like, and yes, how to get on and stay on Santa's nice list. <laughs>